welcome everyone to this panel, uh, which is entitled Energy from Waste. And we don't want to waste any more time. We want to get right to it because there are so many exciting things that we can do with waste. That, as a matter of fact, many times we don't even refer to it as that anymore because we think about it as a very, very important and valuable resource that has many more uses that we can get out of it. So to start us off on our discussion today is Patrick Surface, who is Executive Director uh, with the American Biogas Council. Thanks, Carol, and thanks for putting this panel together. It's always great to be a part of this event. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the American Biogas Council, and we represent 220 companies across the U.S. that are obviously interested in building more biogas systems. So who here, just let's do a raise of hands, who here knows what a biogas system is? All right. Oh, it's getting better every year, just a little bit. Um, great. So for those of you who did not raise your hands, biogas systems, you can basically think of a big tank and it sort of works like a cow's stomach. You know, a cow's, cow will take in food and it'll digest it and it'll burp out methane and then there's some poop and bee that comes out too. Um, same thing, think about putting organic material like food waste and manure and the sludge that you pull out of wastewater and putting it into a big tank with some microbes. Those microbes eat up the organic material. They burp out the methane, which is basically like renewable natural gas, um, especially um, something that, that Marcus is gonna talk more about. And you get to, that has energy in it and that methane can be used for energy just like natural natural gas can. And then the solids and liquids come out too, and all the nutrients that were in your food waste and in your manures, those come through too. So the solids and liquids that come out of that tank, out of your biogas system, those can be used as like a super fertilizer. And being able to recycle those nutrients and use those solids and liquids is an often um, overlooked, but a missed opportunity. Um, so something that we're, we're focusing on a lot. So the, right now, if you look at the biogas market in the U.S., there are 2,000 operational systems. Most people don't know that because most people don't know how many wastewater treatment facilities have biogas systems. And of those 2,000, about 1,200 of them are at wastewater facilities. But there are only 250 on farms. The potential is about 11,000 systems across the country. So going to, from 2,000 to 11,000. And if we do that, we'll be able to um, encourage about $33 billion of capital investment, about 275,000 construction jobs, 20,000 permanent jobs, tons and tons and tons of greenhouse gas emissions um, equal to removing 11, 000, sorry, 11 million vehicles um, off of the roads. And all in that time that we are doing that, we're creating an infrastructure to handle all those organic materials, which are otherwise not necessarily being recycled or maybe not necessarily being used the best way that they could. As Carol said, as we look across the waste spectrum and you look at your glass, metal, paper, and plastics and your organics and everything else, what is the best use of all those materials that we can really, that we can really use? So we see a huge potential for market growth in the U.S. And the question that I've been getting a lot today is, well, why isn't the industry growing faster? And the simple response to that, because I think in all these technologies, is that it's always complicated, right? But the simple response is that we don't have any major barriers. We have lots of little small speed bumps. It's small speed bumps like the fact that if you go to your local permitting facility and say, I want to build a biogas system, what permits do I need? Ch chances are the person that you're talking to is going to not have a clue what to give you. And so they're going to try to give you something else that doesn't fit a biogas system. So you either have to fit your square peg into their round hole, or you have to create a square hole to fit your square peg. And those things take time, and time takes money. And so it's nothing that's really insurmountable. It's just that the industry is really just starting to grow, and those growing pains need to be worked through so that we can develop more systems. But there are also things on the federal policy side that we can do. Lots of small changes that we can make that can really help. And um, if we look at federal policy today, the biogas industry has two asks. One of those is for the production and investment tax credits under Section 45. These are for biogas electricity facilities. So if you have your biogas system, what are you using that biogas for? Are you making vehicle fuel, going to a pipeline, going to electricity, anything they use natural gas for? If you are making it into electricity, then you, there's currently, until the end of this year, there is an investment tax credit that our industry loves. But unless that investment tax credit is extended beyond this year for the Section 45 technologies, which also include hydro and geothermal and, um, and waste energy and biomass, 
then we don't have the certainty in the industry to be able to go through the two to three year project development timeline that it takes to develop these projects. We need that certainty. The second ask is actually a bill that was just introduced three weeks ago. We're super excited. Um, it creates an investment tax credit for biogas f projects that do not use their biogas for electricity, so all the rest of the biogas projects. And perhaps most importantly, it covers nutrient recycling technologies. So you can put a nutrient recycling system on the end of your biogas system, and that's really important because if you are a farmer and you're spreading your raw um, cattle, dairy, chicken, um, poultry, or swine manure on your fields, that raw manure has to be spread when crops are not growing. That means that there's not much of a physical barrier and not much of a chemical barrier from those nutrients going into the waterways, and that can contribute to watershed pollution. If instead you're putting a nutrient recovery technology on the end of your biogas system that removes the nitrogen and phosphorus from those digested materials and then sells those nutrients as fertilizers to the farms that actually need them, because otherwise they're buying synthetic fertilizers, then you're putting exactly the right ratio of nutrients onto your farm, and you're creating a product that can be sold into the other watershed. And those nutrient recovery technologies, some of them are commercial, but they're just really, they're just really developing. And this new bill that was just introduced, um, HR 5489, 5489, it's the Agriculture Environmental Stewardship Act. Um, has 19 co-sponsors now, 11 Republicans and eight Democrats, and uh, we're looking for more co-sponsors for that, especially as tax titles are introduced. So lots of great things to come out of the biogas um, industry. I look forward to questions, and I know uh, the rest of our panelists here are gonna cover a lot of things that are very similar to, uh, to what we do and what we're all trying to do with uh, use, making the best use of our waste materials and uh, creating some energy. Great. And that's another whole way to get a whole lot of stuff out of our watersheds and create revenue streams, right? Yeah. So we're now going to turn to Marcus Gillette, who is the Director of Public and Government Affairs for the Renewable Natural Gas Coalition. Perfect segue. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll follow Patrick's lead here. Um, how many of you know what the difference is between biogas and renewable natural gas? <laughs> Okay, that's good. If you did, I'd be very impressed. Um, so renewable natural gas, like biogas, is uh, derived from the methane that is emitted when organic matter decomposes. Now, that is biogas. So the methane that's captured at these facilities, landfills, wastewater treatment plants, separated municipal solid waste digesters, and ag facilities. Uh, did I say ag again? Landfills. Um, that is captured and then cleaned via technological process to a product that is indistinguishable from natural gas pipeline gas uh, from geologic sources. Uh, so that product can then be injected into the pipeline. It can be compressed or liquefied to become transportation fuel as renewable CNG or renewable LNG. So since Patrick talked uh, quite a bit about feedstocks and what that would mean uh, economically uh, for the benefits of building out these technologies, I'm going to focus a little bit more on end use for the transportation side uh, so that we can complement one another a little bit. Uh, but also, who is the Renewable Natural Gas Coalition? We are a nonprofit association. We advocate for increased use of renewable natural gas from these cellulosic waste feed sources um, so that ultimately uh, our current generation and future generations will have increased access to domestic affordable, reliable, clean energies. Um, so the methane that's captured at these facilities uh, has many, many benefits. Patrick mentioned some of those. It reduces greenhouse, gas re reduces greenhouse gas emissions and associated pollutants. It provides a local source of energy that supports energy independence. Uh, you're converting a waste product into a revenue source. Uh, you're creating a renewable energy that replaces fossil fuels. Uh, you are creating jobs, as Patrick talked a lot about, and, but you're also enhancing the local community image as innovative and sustainable. Now let's get into the transportation side and talk a little bit more about those environmental benefits. Uh, now as CNG and LNG from renewable feedstocks are blended into our transportation infrastructure and our transportation system, it becomes drastically cleaner pretty fast. Um, switching vehicles to run on compressed or liquefied natural gas from geologic sources already has emission benefits. 
Um, natural gas provides 90% lower nitrous oxide emissions using a new near zero uh, engine, natural gas technology, and a 99% SOX reduction as compared to diesel. Now, when you blend in renewable natural gas into that fuel mix, it becomes even cleaner. Uh, blending in 20% renew renewable natural gas provides a 26 to 30% uh, emissions uh, benefit over diesel, and using 100% renewable natural gas can provide uh, carbon reductions over 80%. And renewable natural gas from some feedstocks is even carbon negative, meaning that it sequesters greenhouse gas in the product life cycle. So now that we know how clean it is, what is the demand like industry-wide and nationally? Uh, well. Figures released in April by California Air Resources Board show that as of the end of 2015, 50% uh, of the natural gas fuel being consumed in California was from renewable feedstocks. Um, now, what, what this shows is that renewable natural, gra renewable natural gas's growth in that market is evidence that low carbon fuel standard in California is working to create markets and create production of cleaner fuels. Um, what does this look like when we're going out to the national scale? Um, that, it's a little less certain. Um, the extent of RNG used nationally, uh, EIA sources indicate that between 15 to 35 percent of the natural gas vehicle fuel consumed in the country is from renewable feedstocks, um, depending on which EIA data you look at. Um, but there is evidence that also shows that this industry and renewable natural gas transportation is growing at an incredible unprecedented rate. Uh, that is thanks in part to the renewable fuel standard. In 2013, when uh, EPA's phase two amendments to the renewable fuel standard, um, renewable natural gas achieved uh, cellulosic designation, uh, eligible for cellulosic RINs under the program. At that point in, 2000, in 2013, it was 25.9 million gallons, or ethanol gallon equivalents, being produced uh, of this fuel. 2014 was the pathway approval. By the end of 2015, that had grown fivefold to almost 140 million ethanol gallon equivalents uh, produced last year under the program. Uh, this equated to 98% of all the cellulosic biofuel registered under the renewable fuel standard. Um, so it does provide evidence that that program is also working um, as far as uh, promoting cellulosic fuel growth. Um, current and future production rates look even stronger. Uh, RNG production for transportation fuel is on pace to triple in volume by the end of 2018 uh, from where it was in 2015. Uh, we're on track to reach 230 million gallons uh, that EPA identified in 2016 under the rene renewable volume obligation. Uh, in 2017, uh, we anticipate over 350 million gallons uh, above the current 312 uh, gallon, million gallon estimate uh, the EPA has in the draft rule, and we expect that to grow to over 450 million gallons in 2018. Uh, so how do we ensure that these resources get utilized as renewable natural gas? Uh, Patrick uh, talked a lot about the tax credits, um, and those tax incentives are crucial. We advocate for, for tax parity, but it's also really crucial that we protect these programs that uh, our industry shows are working, uh, the low carbon fuel standard, uh, as well as the renewable fuel standard are integral to uh, continuing to develop out the industry, do a lot to um, the uncertainty, and, and investors need that policy stability, uh, as Patrick was mentioning. Um, however, if Congress does uh, decide to, to open up and start amending pieces of the renewable fuel standard, it's just critical that we ensure that the cellulosic provisions uh, in, in those policies, that they remain in place. Um, and with that, I think I will save the rest for questions. I do have a lot of information as well on what it would mean to build out uh, a lot of these feedstocks, as Patrick was mentioning, uh, but we can save that for questions. Thanks, thanks, Marcus. And I think it's also really important for people to understand the benefits that a lot of existing policies really are providing, because many times there's kind of only one-sided uh, information that's that's getting out with regard to that. So I think that's a really, really important point to make. So we're now going to turn to Sarah Bixby, 
who is the Deputy Executive Director of, Solid, of the Solid Waste Association of North America, also fondly known as SWANA. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I have an easier ask for you. Did anybody eat lunch today? <laughs> <laughs> but if you had leftovers, you've created food waste. And my remarks today are going to focus on the policy implications and actually the infrastructure implications of food waste as a renewable energy source. Uh, SWANA is a professional association. That means we have about 8,500 people working in the industry. Uh, you will interact with them as your garbage haulers, as your recyclers, at the local government level doing education, um, as consultants building facilities. And in each of those steps, those folks are focused on trying to advance their practices away from just looking at waste as a waste and into looking at waste as a resource that we can use in a better way. One of the ways that SWANA focuses on using things in a better way is through our Applied Research Foundation. And they involve local governments, corporations, um, some of our chapters in determining which topics are coming up that will be of interest going forward to all of us in the future. One of the recent things that they did in a report just released in April was a study on food waste diversion programs and their impacts on municipal solid waste systems. That research began well before the EPA and the US Department of Agriculture released a um, food waste reduction goal of 50% by the year 2030. But the research adds a really interesting data set to how we're going to address that food waste goal going forward. So from a waste management standpoint, and for today's purposes, the primary benefits of food waste recovery of managing your lunch leftovers um, include reducing landfill methane um, emissions, and they include the potential to generate biogas that can be used to produce electricity. So those benefits are very consistent with our goals of shifting toward more resource management and a sustainable use of resources. But it's also important to acknowledge that shifting food waste from our existing systems into new processing technologies is going to affect the production of recovered energy from a lot of current programs. Um, nationally, that includes 77 waste energy facilities and 650 landfill gas recovery projects already in place, already well invested. So there are about approximately 66 million tons of food waste a year that are lost or wasted in the United States. We don't have nearly the capacity needed to meet a 50% goal um, given that quantity of food waste. The federal goal that was announced established a hierarchy of technologies to address um, food waste reduction, which begins with the idea of source reduction. Eat all of your ice cream, don't throw it away. Um, <laughs> let's feed hungry people, you know, feed animals. And then it moves on to less preferred processing options, such as recovering wasted food as a feedstock and ultimately disposing of it in a landfill or a waste energy facility as a waste. We believe, as SWANA, that we can change how the food is managed and handled in our systems. We have to direct more effort to feeding people and feeding animals. Um, we're not gonna get anywhere near a 50% reduction if we don't address those steps. But it's also unlikely that those steps alone will change food production or food distribution enough to get us to 50%. And that means we're going to see the construction of additional processing facilities. Once food is considered a waste, once we've thrown it away and it's in that disposal stream, local governments working with their collection and processing partners have to have the ability to make local decisions. Um, it's great to set a national goal for food waste diversion, but we cannot accompany that with a national standard for how local governments address food waste diversion. Each of them, each city and county, each processor has a existing resource, existing infrastructure, um, their own needs. 
that they have to take into consideration to develop an optimal um, recovery system encompassing all of those steps for them. And it's because of the diversity of our communities nationwide that I can sit here and agree with Patrick about anaerobic digestion, you know, agree um, that we need to look at compressed natural gas vehicles, probably talk about some landfill gas. I mean, all of those things fit into our integrated systems to address food waste and other types of waste going into an energy stream. Our research report focused on the disposal end, primarily of the processing and disposal systems, composting, incineration, and landfilling. Most of the available waste stream can be handled in composting facilities and AD facilities, but we don't have enough of them, so we're going to have to develop them. Data from EPA said that there, only, there was only 4% of our food waste processed in a composting facility in 2013. AD is probably the preferred system, but it's not very much in use in the United States yet for waste, and it's currently more expensive. So we're going to have to develop more markets, markets for finished compost, markets for biogas, and the biogas in particular is going to have to compete with petroleum, um, with natural gas, and with other fuels from more established renewable energy sources, many of which already receive preferential um, tax treatment. So we support the extension of the tax credits beyond December of this year for municipal solid waste and also for uh, landfill gas. We also, again, reiterate that the local governments have to have the ability and take the responsibility to make decisions on food waste diversion for their local systems. It has to be local government decisions to implement a national food waste reduction goal. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sarah. Uh, so rounding this whole discussion out is Kevin Kaushar, who is the Vice President for Government Affairs and Chapter Operations with the National Waste and Recycling Association. Kevin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I feel like we should have a catalog or a phone book. Let's get up to the table here. Does anybody remember what a phone book was? Um, <laughs> That's part of the problem, right? Exactly. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Kevin Krausar. Uh, I'm with the National Waste and Recycling Association. Our, our member companies uh, represent, um, the, well, we, our association represents the private sector side of the waste and recycling business. Uh, we estimate that the segment of the industry represented by our companies process, collects and processes probably 70% of the uh, recycling, that is consumer recycling, uh, in the United States. And obviously the waste disposal system is a very important part of, of the business model. Our companies are as large as Waste Management, um, Republic, uh, as I was coming up here behind the Cannon Building here this morning. Uh, Traffic was blocked by a big progressive truck that was steering into one of the buildings side by uh, behind uh, a cannon. Uh, uh, progressive is now a, a part of uh, Waste Connections. Uh, our companies are involved in not just waste collection and processing recycling. Uh, we're involved in, in many of the segments of renewables. Uh, I believe our member companies, or we have representatives in probably all four of these, the, all three of the other, the other associations that are here today. So there obviously is, is a lot of exploration going on, a lot of new technologies. And I would like to say that, that what I would talk about too is, is renewed technology, but everybody says, well, landfill. Landfills have been around for years. Uh, landfills have been around for years, but the technology that has been going into and the current way that, that landfills are built, are cited, are approved, uh, is certainly advanced technology that, that maybe didn't exist several years ago. Uh, landfill uh, operation is generally uh, administered and regulated at the federal level by RICRA, the uh, Resource Conservation Recovery and Recovery Act. Uh, modern landfills are high-tech, uh, they're carefully monitored, with containment systems both for leachate, which is the liquid that flows into the two uh, uh, landfills, but also uh, emissions that, that are also produced into the year. Um, 
Landfills are also the source of methane, as was described in uh, the technical process that is, is available, uh, is that is, is um, the, the technical process you've already heard about, so I won't go into that, but I can say that the uh, EPA estimates that there are about 640 landfills throughout the United States that produce methane. It's captured, it's, it's uh, processed, uh, and it has a se several uses. So of this, there are 640 current landfills that, that process meth methane and, into a clean burning fuels uh, and electricity, uh, but there are also about 400 potential landfills that could be converted uh, to methane production uh, should that become available. Uh, EPA estimates, in addition, that the, the electricity produced by renewable energy from methane produced in landfills can power about 1.2 million homes throughout the United States. Uh, and we estimate that, that energy derived both in, in electricity and in other uses, as, as, uh, as Marcus described, uh, also account for about 5% of renewable energy. That is, 5% of renewable energy sources today comes from uh, from landfills. Um, it, so in addition to putting uh, uh, electricity into the system through the electricity providers, there are other uses as, as Marcus described, and that is uh, the, the methane can also be uh, converted to compressed natural gas, liquid natural gas, and used to power, power a growing fleet of the companies. The, the vehicles that are coming around to your neighborhoods and picking up your recyclables and your waste are also being powered on a, uh, more and more uh, by compressed natural gas. Uh, and so some of the things that we would ask for as far as the Congress is concerned is certainly the renewal of the, the, renewal of the renewable gas tax credit, the ITC, uh, which is up at the end of this year. Uh, also, that are set to expire the end of 2016 are the renewal, the uh, tax credits for uh, using uh, compressed natural gas in vehicles, the CNG vehicle tax credit, which is a tax credit based on the amount of, of fuel replaced uh, through regular diesel. Uh, and then the other tax credit is the tax credit for the installation, the building, and the maintenance of uh, compressed natural gas refueling facilities, which are obviously so important to making sure that, that uh, that we're able to maintain those fleets and, and keep them moving. Uh, I was surprised to learn not too long ago that the Goddard, that 31 buildings at the Goddard Space Center uh, are now powered by or heated and air conditioned uh, because of landfill gas. Um, there's a BMW plant, if you're driving uh, just north of Spartan, uh, Greenville, Spartanburg, I don't know if there are any South Carolina residents here, but you see that brand new big BMW production facility. Uh, that's also being powered by liquid, by uh, uh, electricity and, and power from methane from a landfill uh, about 10 miles away. They actually built a separate pipeline 10 miles from the landfill to that facility to assist in power production. And one of our member companies called Southside Landfill in Indianapolis, Indiana, actually has a landfill just outside of Indianapolis which methane produced in that facility uh, goes to a greenhouse, uh, which uh, last time uh, I had talked with uh, one of the representatives, uh, it was back in December, he was just getting on a truck and getting ready to go out and deliver poinsettias, uh, which were produced in that greenhouse. So there are lots of exciting opportunities out there. Again, you've heard about all of the fantastic new technologies. Uh, while landfills have been around for a long time, uh, the, certainly the, the technology, the investment in technology to make them more efficient, to, to assist in, in production and converting more landfills to, uh, to uh, energy production uh, could go a long way in solving our processes. Again, our members want to be engaged and are engaged in, in uh, all of the technologies you've heard talked about today. Uh, and it's exciting to have this opportunity to share some of these uh, experiences uh, with all of you. Great, thank you. And I must say, it's exciting to hear about all this stuff and all the businesses being generated all over the country and that can still be generated. Um, because it's, I, I personally just love the whole idea of using everything so that we don't waste um, 
that, so that we don't waste things. And so I think it's so exciting in terms of looking at all these cool applications. And what we all need to know are more and more of the great stories and applications that are coming out. So. And I forgot you. to mention, Carol, I'm sorry, that everything I know about landfill and waste energy through landfills is in this two-page paper. So I've got plenty of copies <laughs> up here that you can take with everything you. everything that you know? Everything oh I know is in goodness. this paper. And okay. it, it, right. Yesterday, this was eight pages. Today, it's two. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very, very much. We really appreciate it. And make sure that you visit those booths. Okay, thank you.